dear friends, this is Pastor Brad Abley, and I welcome you, Elam Theological students, to this last section of Old Testament Survey Part 1 as we go through Genesis through Deuteronomy. And uh, <clears throat> today we're going to get into Deuteronomy. I don't know if we'll finish Deuteronomy today, but we'll try. I also want to mention that, just a reminder, that the ultimate goal of what we're trying to accomplish, the ultimate goal is to make disciples of all the nations. So as, as those that the Lord has called into uh, leadership, to, to gospel ministry, to pulpit ministry, one of the things we have to keep at the very front is the forefront of our minds and hearts is to disciple other people, generally speaking, younger people. And the reason why I mention this, there's a there's a a different reason that I'm mentioning this today, and that is because my spiritual father, uh, Billy Graham, the great evangelist, the greatest evangelist who has ever lived, who's spoken to more people than any other evangelist ever. He passed away, went to be with the Lord uh, a week ago. But today, he is lying, what we call he's, he's lying in state in one of the most important areas of our nation, and that is the, in the rotunda of the U United States Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And that is being televised throughout the world on Facebook and elsewhere, even as I speak. And I thought, you know, I'd like to watch that live, but I also know that my spiritual father would say to me, no, you have a, you have a charge to keep. You have a gospel to preach. You focus on teaching those pastors in Siaya, Kenya, and I'm glad to do that at this moment. But one of the legacies of Billy Graham, one of the greatest legacies of all, is his character and his integrity. I can assure you that after having preached the gospel to so many millions of people, if his life was brought down through scandal of, of any kind, whether moral or theological or financial, he would not be honored as he is by the highest officials of our land. Our president is speaking very highly of him, even right now as I speak. And all the senators and congressmen are there, and, and then hundreds of thousands of people are going to file past his coffin to, res to, to pay respects and honor to him. And he is my spiritual father. That is, I am his disciple, though he never mentored me personally. That is, I never met him. But through his preaching and through his example, I watched his preaching for years and years and years. And I learned how to pray because of Billy Graham. I learned how to memorize scripture because of Billy Graham. I learned a great reverence for God because of Billy Graham. And and humanly speaking, if I have anything to give that is good for the Lord, it began with this mighty servant of the Lord who was extremely humble. And as a matter of fact, the coffin that he is in right now cost $200. That is cheap by United States standards. And it was made by prisoners in the state of Louisiana. And the reason that Billy Graham did that is, is because he certainly said he is not there. He is in heaven. And why spend a lot of money on a, a coffin that his body is going to, to house, but when Jesus comes back, he's going to raise that body from the dead. I've said the same thing for many years to my wife when I die. Put me in the least expensive coffin. There's no point in, in wasting money for a dead body when I'm going to be straight in the presence of the Lord. 
So I just want to share what's on my heart before we get into Deuteronomy because this is a very important moment in our nation's history. I've already been praying that God would use the funeral of Billy Graham to bring multitudes, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people all over the world to faith in him. And of course, by the time uh, you have this broadcast, that moment will be long gone. This is February the 28th, uh, 2018. And all the videos that I've been doing have taken place over the course of January and February. But um, I want to challenge you, uh, beloved, to be men and women of honor and integrity, Christ-likeness and godliness, even as I'm allowing the Holy Spirit by saying this to challenge me to be Christ-like and godly, to walk in integrity for however long the Lord gives me as a minister of the gospel. Well, with that said, let's pray and let's trust the Holy Spirit to have his way in us. Father, before we go any further, before we open the word of God, we ask now that you, Holy Spirit, would come and open our eyes and, and enlarge our hearts and help us to hear uh, with faith and the desire to obey, the desire to bring you glory and honor. And Father, I pray that you would help me uh, to bring this teaching with clarity and that you would be glorified and honored and that it would result in the encouragement and the building up of the men and women who are watching this video, that their churches would flourish and that the loss would be saved and the gospel go forth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let's get into our study uh, in Deuteronomy. Uh, this, again, is the last section of our first part of Old Testament Survey Part 1. Remember I call it the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for us today. As I'm waiting for my Kindle to, to fire up, one of the, every time, you don't know this, but I'll share this with you, every time that I do a video, I have to do a test to make sure the sound is working, to make sure everything is working. Every time I get a microphone check, uh, uh, every time I'm doing a sound check for my radio ministry, I always quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in Yahweh. Remember, Yahweh is personal, he is active, and he is faithful to keep covenant. That's the meaning of his name. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. I have to put it this way. Brad, don't try to figure it out. Don't try to figure it all out. That doesn't mean that I don't use wisdom and I don't ask. But there are some times that the Lord doesn't give me the answer. He just wants me to trust that he's going to do what he intends to do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, that is, in everything that you do, know Him. The New American Standard translated as acknowledge Him, but the Hebrew word is deeper and stronger. It means to know Him and He will make your paths straight. I think that that is one of the most, uh, those two verses in Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6 are two of the most important verses to uh, bring faith in our hearts in the entire Bible. And of course, where does it come from? It comes from the Old Testament. Accordingly, the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for believers today. Now, Deuteronomy comes from a Greek word which means second law giving. Um, and it really is not a second law, but rather it's a review and an expansion 
and a reiteration, a bringing forth again of the original law that was given at Sinai, but in this particular case, it's for a new generation that is about to enter the promised land. The theme and the purpose of Deuteronomy can be summarized this way. Watch yourself lest you forget. Learn from the previous generation. And that's one of the things that, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to mention Billy Graham from the outset is because Billy Graham's ministry lasted for 70, uh, more than 70 years. And it's important to learn from uh, all of the successes and, and even the mistakes that he made in order to emulate him. He's a an example of a man of God of integrity that that carried that anointing and that integrity for the long run and honored God and brought a great example to the world. Well, his history is some something important for me and us in the present to then propel us into the future. But in the case of Deuteronomy, they had to carefully consider the example of the previous generation, which was a bad example. And Moses is going to tell the, this new generation in Deuteronomy, don't repeat the mistakes of the past. Guard your heart. So after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites were on the very eve of entering the promised land. But before they did, it was necessary, lest they forget what God had done and who they were, that they be reminded by Moses about all that God had done for them in delivering them from Egypt and in providing for them miraculously in the wilderness. Remember, this is a generation that hasn't seen running streams and and um, and green grass and fruit trees and all these things that they were about to experience when they got into the beautiful land of Canaan. Now this new generation must understand and heed God's holy law, the Torah, which is the teaching or the instruction of Yahweh, which was so vital to their ability to remain in the land and function as God's holy nation, as his kingdom of priests and as his witness and light to the nations. Eventually, they would rebel against God. Hundreds of years later, they would start worshiping idols. And what happened? God allowed the Assyrians to take away the 10 northern tribes into Assyria, which is modern day, uh, kind of the border of Iraq and Iran. And then he allowed Babylon, which is in modern day Iraq, to come uh, about a hundred plus years later and take Judah as captives into a foreign land. So God warned them, if you rebel against me, there are consequences. But if you obey me, there are consequences for good. If you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and let's look at verses 1 through 8. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verses 1 through 8. Uh, Moses says, Now, O Israel, listen. And the word he the Hebrew word listen, Shema, means to hear with the intent to obey. We'll get into that later. Listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to do so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what Yahweh has done in the case of Baal 
Peor, or Baal Peor. For all the men who follow Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. You can find that in Numbers 25, verses 1 through 9. But you held fast to Yahweh, you who held fast to Yahweh your God are alive today, every one of you. They witnessed how many men and women lost their lives because of their outward defiant rebellion against Yahweh. But there were others that didn't rebel and they were alive at that very moment. Uh, and then verses 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as Yahweh my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them for that. Keeping them and doing them is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Going back to Billy Graham, because of his integrity, because he lived this out, he has a worldwide audience that is listening to him because people will listen to us if they trust us, if they believe that we care for them, if we believe that, they, that we love them, and if our lives are lives of integrity. But if that's not the case, they will not listen to us. So notice that this is an evangelistic purpose. Even here in the Old Testament, let's read that again. Verse 6, So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, that is the Gentiles, who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what, verse 7, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as Yahweh our God whenever we call on Him? What a promise for answer prayer, whenever we call on Him. Verse 8, for, or what great nation... <laughs> Is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole Torah which I am setting before you today? The commands are good and clean and righteous and life giving and protecting and meant to bless us, not to constrict us. Oh, thank you, Lord. Ero Kamano Ahinya Nyesai. Men. Now, as part of this theme or purpose that we're talking about, Deuteronomy also emphasizes the vital necessity of teaching children to love and obey Nyesai. It, co it consists of a series of farewell speeches. That's what we find in Deuteronomy from Moses as he prepared the people not only to enter the, the land that God was giving them, but to conquer it and possess it and honor him in the way that the people lived as a holy people to him and not as the wicked pagan nations lived. Friends, this book was written at the end of the 40 years of the children of Israel wandering in the desert, whereas Numbers was written much earlier. Moses also provided an important history for the new generation. That's in Deuteronomy 1, chapters 1 through 4, as well as a renewal of the covenant between Yahweh and their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, the renewal of the covenant, um, as, as I've been reflecting, pondering, on uh, Billy Graham's um, 
death and his entrance into heaven, it, it seems like there's a renewal of a covenant between God and me. I'm, I, I've allowed the Holy Spirit over the course of this past week uh, because Billy Graham passed away on, it was either February the 21st or the 22nd. See, today is Wednesday the 28th. Uh, he died on, he, it's only been one week. So he died on February the 21st. And um, so what was I, I just lost my train of thought. Um, the Since then, the entire week I've been thinking about his life, his legacy, and it's, it's brought a greater level of reverence to God and a greater level of sobriety before God, a, a greater um, passion for Him, a greater passion for the lost, a greater reverence for Him. So there's almost like a stirring renewal in my heart because of His example. And, um, and that's what Moses intended for this new generation about to enter the promised land. There, there's also an emphasis on obedience and faithfulness to Yahweh in the covenant for his blessings. That is in Deuteronomy chapters 5 all the way through to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Now as a matter of fact, you'll find the Ten Commandments again in Deuteronomy chapter 5. They first appeared in Exodus chapter 20 and then they appear in Deuteronomy 5 again why is that because Moses and of course the Holy Spirit inspiring him wants the people to understand the centrality the focus of those Ten Commandments the book of Deuteronomy closes with a revelation of Israel's future that's in Deuteronomy 27 through 34, uh, a future that is both near, uh, chapters 27 and 28, and distant, chapters 28 through 30, and then Deuteronomy concludes uh, with Moses' very stirring, touching farewell to the people. Now, it's his, it's it, it's importance, the importance of Deuteronomy in the entirety of Scripture, including the New Testament, can be appreciated in how often Deuteronomy is quoted in the New Testament. The most quoted book of the Old Testament in the New Testament, can you guess what that might be? It is the book of Psalms, the book of encouragement, my favorite book in the Bible, perhaps. Then followed by Isaiah. Isaiah is the next most quoted book in the New Testament. After that, Genesis. And then after that, Exodus. And then finally, Deuteronomy comes next. But guess how many times Deuteronomy has been quoted in the New Testament? 195 times. And that tells us how important the book of Deuteronomy is in the New Testament. The very first statement of faith for the Israelites, uh, still recited by Jewish people today, is called the Shema, and we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, uh, especially verse 4. So the Shema is spelled S H E M A. And it means to hear, to listen, and to obey. That's what the Shema is all about. Uh, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. If you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and let's look at verses, um, begin in verse 1. 
and we will read uh, probably to verse 9. Okay? Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. So that, here's the reason, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear Yahweh your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, verse 3, notice the appeal from Moses. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you. You see, this is the desire of God for us. He is good. He wants the best for us. But we have a free will, don't we? He says that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. That is a, a symbolic or figurative way of saying that the land is bountiful. It's a good land. You can flourish and prosper in the land. And then he comes to the great statement of faith, the very first statement of faith for the Jewish people. And he says, Hear, O Israel, Shema Israel, the Lord is our God, Adonai Eloheinu. The Lord, Yahweh, is one, Echad. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Get it in your heart. What does Proverbs 4 verse 23 say? Guard your heart with all diligence. For from it flow the springs of life. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. That is the worship of Yahweh ought to be natural. It ought to be consistent. It ought to apply to every area of life so that your children can see that it matters to you beyond Sunday because they're watching you Monday through Saturday they're watching your attitude they're watching your temper they're listening to your words if they see a different man or woman of God Monday through Saturday than what they see on Sunday you may fool the people in your congregation but you will not fool your children you see Yahweh is wise. He knows. He is looking for consistency uh, in our lives, throughout our lives. Not perfection, but consistency. You shall bind them as a sign on your, on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The Hebrew word, I know I've gone over this before, but I love, I love, love, love teaching on the Holy Trinity, the triune God. And part of the reason that I love doing that is because it's truth and it, and it, it's vital because it speaks to the very nature of God. So the, the Hebrew word echad, translated one in English, E-C-H-A-D, 
is 1 in unity. 1 in unity. So let me let me illustrate this. If you will, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. If you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and let's look at verses let's look at verse 5. Genesis uh, chapter 1 and verse 5. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So it's, you know, there's one aspect of the day and then there's another aspect of the day. And there was evening and there was morning one day. The word is echad. Not one in isolation, but one in unity. There's a unity between light and darkness, or day and night. The, the day is not the night. The night is not the day. They're separate. The day stands on its own. The night stands on its own. But it's one day. Echad. One in unity. Uh, in Genesis 2, verse 25, And the man... Uh, no, verse 24. Genesis 2, verse 24. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Echad. The man is not the woman. The woman is not the man. I am a separate individual, different from my wife, Maureen. Let me see if I can find a picture of, uh, of my wife. So here's a picture of us. Hope you can see it well enough. Uh, there's a picture of us from many years ago. Uh, we are in Great Britain uh, by the White Cliffs of Dover. You can see that we are two individuals, not one. But yet, spiritually, we are one. Right? Uh, the, the, they, they shall become one flesh. So that is one in unity. And now we are beginning to see, even in Genesis, Yahweh is one, one in unity. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. And yet Jesus could say in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And yet He's praying to the Father while he's on earth. The Father sends the Son. The Son goes willingly to earth and takes upon himself flesh. He is one person with two distinct natures. Fully God, fully man, but one person. Echad. And so we'll find the beginning of understanding of the triune God or the, the Holy Trinity. Now, um, let's look at uh, Genesis 3, verse 22. Genesis 3 and verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So one is echad. One is Echad. Now let's look at um, e, uh, let's look at Numbers thirty-two, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then Deuteronomy, Numbers thirteen, and verse twenty-three. Numbers thirteen and verse twenty-three. Then they came to the valley of Echshol. Eshkol, and from there they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. Guess what? And they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and the fig figs. A single cluster of grapes. Guess what that word single is? 
Echad, one. One cluster of grapes. The grapes are plural, but it's one cluster of grapes. One in unity. Or in, um, in uh, Numbers 14 and verse 15, Moses, speaking to Yahweh, says, Now if you slay this people as one man, He's talking about the whole nation of Israel, and yet combined they are one. Then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, etc., etc. So one, one in unity, one in union. That is what we, we begin to find out about the triune God all the way back in Genesis and in Deuteronomy. But this statement of faith is the anchor of the Jewish people uh, back in Deuteronomy, and it and it remains that way today. Why is it significant? Because the Egyptians worshipped many gods. The Canaanites worshipped many gods. Here comes the Jewish people. They worship one God, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Echad, one in unity. We can see the um, we, we can see the triune God um, in Isaiah 40 verses 11 through 18. I'm not going to take the time uh, to go through that. I would like to, but if you'll notice on your own time in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11, uh, when it speaks of, of Yahweh as the shepherd, what is Jesus call himself, he calls himself the good shepherd. And then in verses 12 through 18, what is the focus on? It is on the Holy Spirit as God, omniscient, omnipresent, and um, uh, uh, omnipotent as well. And then of course, we come to, uh, you find the, the triune God uh, on the lips of Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, but the one name. Uh, and then one of the benedictions that I love to do in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 14, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. What is Paul saying there? He is, he is explaining and blessing them with the a power and the authority of, of the triune God. It's just fascinating. Why is that important to us? Because in part, when we look at the relationship between the Father and the Son, we see complete unity and harmony. The, the Son submits to the Father even though He's equal with the Father. The, the Son is fully dependent upon the Holy Spirit even though He is God the Son. Uh, he depends on the Holy Spirit to anoint him. So there's there's perfect unity within the Godhead, and that models to us the importance of unity with each other. What is What do we find out in Ephesians 4 verse 3? Therefore be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Praise the Lord. So, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 is a creed. We call it a creed, uh, a belief. So when we get to church history, we'll talk about the Nicene. We talked about this before, uh, but we talked about, uh, we'll talk about the Nicene Creed. which is um, the historic statement of faith for the church that goes all the way back to 325 A.D. Then you have what is called the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the Apostles' Creed. That's another creed. It's it's a um, the Nicene Creed is. I prefer the Nicene Creed because it's a fuller statement. The Apostles' Creed 
um, is not quite as full or expansive or comprehensive. And by the way, the Apostles' Creed wasn't written by the Apostles. It is, it is a formulation of the early church fathers and, and then um, several generation of, um, of theologians in, in the early part of the church history to lay down systematically the beliefs of our faith and it was based upon apostolic teaching. That's what that's for. Now, creed comes from the he from the Latin word. It comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. I believe. I love the, the statements of, of faith in the Nicene Creed and in the Apostles' Creed because I think they're important for us to say as a church body every now and then to, to capsulize what we really believe. It's very important. So the very first statement of faith is found in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it is Israel's first creed. Now, the reason uh, Latin was was the language that was used throughout Europe uh, for centuries and centuries and centuries, and a lot of the early church um, wrote the, the theologians wrote in Latin, and so we still use some of their phrases. Latin, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So it. This creed, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Shema, uniquely explains and describes the oneness of God over against the polytheistic, idolatrous, pagan nations. However, the Hebrew word translated one, echad, refers to one in unity, not one in isolation. So, um, one in isolation or singularity is the the Hebrew word I think I need to move this over here a little bit the Hebrew word is Yahid Yahid which means singularity singularity not unity So, Yahid is, is something or someone that stands alone. So when, <clears throat> in Genesis 22, three times, <clears throat> Yahweh says uh, to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Yahid. Because there's no union spiritually uh, or, or physically between Isaac and Abraham. He, Abraham, Isaac stands alone. Take now your son, your only son, Yahid. So that's singular. And there's a contrast between Yahid and Echad. A significant part of Old Testament theology, we're going to move on to a different subject now, so we finished uh, the teaching of, of the triune God. Um, so now we're going to talk about covenant. A significant part of Old Testament theology is the idea of covenant, which is quite prominent in Deuteronomy. A biblical covenant is unlike a contract where two parties enter into a mutually beneficial agreement and can dissolve the agreement contractually. Instead, the biblical covenant begins with Yahweh's love for a people that he has chosen for himself to also display his goodness and his glory. Praise the Lord. We are almost done here. If you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 31. Deuteronomy chapter 4 
and verse 31. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 31. For the Lord your God is a compassionate God, deep love. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers, which he swore to them. And then, if you'll turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 8. Deuteronomy 7, let's go back to verse 7. So Deuteronomy 7, uh, verses 7 and 8. Yahweh did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. What is he saying there? That Yahweh did not choose the people uh, that he created to make himself look good. He didn't go for the, the mightiest people and make them his own. He went for the weakest people, the fewest people, to show himself strong. Because he, he um, though he's high and exalted, yet he regards the lowly as what what uh, David says in Psalm 138. He says, Yahweh did not set his love on you. He set his love on you. He did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than all the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Paul kind of carries on in that with the Corinthians when he says, consider your calling, brethren, there were not many mighty, not many noble, not many wise, but God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame the wise, etc., etc. Then, then in verse 8 of Deuteronomy 7, But because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, Yahweh brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And that's what he's done for us. He has brought us out of slavery, out of darkness, and into his marvelous light. Amen? Can you see the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament? Isn't it just wonderful? Praise the Lord. O Pak Ruth, O Paki Yesu, Nyesai Ber, Nyesai Duong. Now, uh, Koro, this does not, however, mean that Israel had no obligations to Yahweh in this covenant. Their obligations you can see in Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 through 6. I wish I, I would love to go through that, but my voice is going, and uh, I want to make sure that I, I don't use up more space on the computer, so I'm going to move through this a little bit more quickly. But even in their failures... Yahweh did not end or break his covenant with his people. So one commentator writes, If the relationship between Israel and Yahweh had been that implied in a modern contract, Yahweh's commitment would have been contingent upon Israel keeping its obligations. But in the covenant relationship, Yahweh keeps his part, the promises, because of his love and because he is God, because he is faithful. A simple but helpful summary and outline is offered by Norman Geisler. Of course, this is in your notes. Genesis tells us of the plan of God. Exodus shows us the redemptive power of God. Leviticus shows us the person of God. And then Numbers, the providence of God. Finally, in Deuteronomy, we discover the principles of God. Deuteronomy ends with the renewal of God's covenant with Israel, and that is chapter 29, with Joshua's appointment as the new leader of the nation in chapter 31, and then, sadly, Moses' death in chapter 34, and because Moses, unfortunately, disobeyed God, by uh, striking the rock instead of speaking to it, Yahweh did not allow him to go into the promised land. 
There are many reasons for that. I, I don't have time to go into that now. The key word in Deuteronomy is the word covenant. It appears 27 times um, in Deuteronomy, or, or approximately 27 times. Um, Jesus in Deuteronomy, the statement about Moses, uh, or from Moses in, in Deuteronomy 18.15, is one of the clearest portraits of Jesus. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. In other words, Moses is saying someone greater than me is coming and he is the one that is appointed by God to be the Messiah. You shall listen to him. And this is quoted in Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. Well, that is, is um, that's it. That completes our course on the Old Testament survey. Let's just thank God for uh, the time that we've had to study together and give him praise. Father, we thank you for the richness of your word, for the life of your spirit, for your presence, for your power. And Father, I just commission these students these men and women of God, to go forth and be your, your um, men and women who will represent you in a way that pleases you. Give them wisdom in how they teach your word and help them to raise up disciples so that we can complete the Great Commission. Lord Jesus, we look forward to the day that we go to be with you in the ultimate promised land where we will receive our eternal rest. But until then, help us to be faithful to you all the days of our lives. And we ask this in your mighty name. Amen and amen. Until next time, this is Pastor Brad Abley. God bless you.